But that day is a special day. Because the Prophet ﷺ said on that day, Allah descends to the lowest heaven in a manner that befits His majesty and honor unlike His creation. And He questions the inhabitants of that heaven, who are these people, even though He fully knows. Who are these people? They're, they're, they're half naked, they're tired, they're crying, they're begging on this, in this plain uh, open field. What do, they, what do they want? And the angels respond, Oh Allah, our Lord, they're asking you. What are they asking? What do they want? They want you to forgive them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to those inhabitants to bear witness that on this day, I've forgiven all of them. All of their minor sins. All the minor sins they have committed their entire life, major sins have to be repented. Tawbah is the condition for the acceptance of major, repentance of major sins. But for all those minor slights and slips and mishaps they've made all of their life till now, gone. Wiped it off. Clean slate. That's the greatness of this day. Even someone who maybe just happened to get there. Maybe there was a man, one man who just happened to be there. The angels will say, you know, he's just here because everybody else was going. You know how we Muslims are. We see a great line going somewhere. Hey, got to be some in this line. We're going to go in line. I've seen it in Muslim countries. People get in line. They don't even know what they're in line for. So in Egypt all the time. I used to ask, what is this line for? I don't know. <laughs> what are you in it for? There must be something at the other end of it. Maybe that guy was there just because of that. Allah says that I've forgiven him too. It's the greatness of that day. Now after this day, the Prophet ﷺ said something to this ummah that should be embedded into the brain of every single believer. He said something that will become one of his most, if not most, authentic a hadith out of his mouth. Narrated by the most companions with the most authentic chains of transmissions over the period of time. The most complete of it is narrated by Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu was standing right next to him. And it was narrated in the Musnad of Imam Ahmed. Rahimahullah ta'ala. Umar said the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam gave what would become known as the farewell sermon. He called everybody he said, come, I have to tell you something. Just everybody come. Everybody come. He started it by saying how important what he was about to say is. He began by praising Allah and then he said, <coughs> pay very close attention to what I'm about to say because I don't know whether I will be with you again on this day at this place after this year realizing that his life might be coming towards an end things were happening to such an extent that he felt as though he might not be around to see this for another year so he said listen to what I have to tell you now this might be the last chance to have all of you here like this so it's important he began it off and we're not going to go through the entirety of it but he began it off by explaining the first person ever in recorded history to abolish racism. First person ever in recorded history, remember that. First person ever in written down history to clearly say that a white person is not better than a black person, a black person is not better than a white person, an Arab is not better than a non-Arab, a non-Arab is not better than an Arab. What makes you better in front of the eyes of Allah is your taqwa. Is your consciousness and piety and your protection between him, you and his punishment. And then he also extorted us to be just in our dealings with each other, abolishing riba, abolishing the system. And riba is not just interest. <laughs> There's a lot involved in riba. Riba is also when we cheat each other in dealings. When we claim one thing is the best of something we know good and well is not. That's riba. And unfortunately in the Muslim world, everything is the best. <laughs> It's always the best. It's the best water ever. Best. Best water ever. This is just how we are. What makes it any better? Because I say it's better. But he said, don't cheat in your dealings in business, basically. He also talked about women. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Explaining that women to us, he was speaking directly to the men at this point, that women are in your maintenance, so be careful of how you take care of them. And he made the very bold statement in his lifetime that the best of you are those who are best to their wives. And he used to never add on this type of phrase, and I am the best of you in that regard. Very rare would he praise himself. But in this regard, I am the best of you in this regard. So he's very careful about that. But towards the end of this speech, the very last thing he would say would have such a lasting impact on those who were there, <coughs> that it became the catalyst for what would become a global Muslim empire that would stretch across the civilized world 
for a very, very, very long time until we forgot. What was the last statement of the Pharaoh was Anybody? The last phrase. Those of you who are here, tell this to those that are not here. That was his last statement. Those of you who are here right now listening to my words, convey this message to those that aren't here. Because it may be that the people whom you tell it to may understand it better than you. May understand it and grasp it and contain it better than you. You see, a lot of us have read the farewell sermon and have missed, not missed that phrase, but missed the weight of that phrase. Not understanding what just happened. What happened when he said that? You see, for 23 years, the Prophet had carried, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the torch of Nabuwa, the torch of prophethood, the, the torch of conveying the message of Tawheed to the world. And that torch before him had only been entrusted to prophets and messengers before him. Before him it was entrusted to Isa. Before him it was trusted to a prophet for a prophet. That it went from one prophet's hands to another. It was their job. And Allah says this in Surah Tubayyinah that the followers responsibilities in the Ummah before us, in the Ummah, the nations before us, was to only worship Allah, worship Allah, make the deen pure for him, establish Salah, pay zakah, wa thalikul deen qayyimah. And that was the right religion for them. Just continue to do what Allah said until the next prophet comes. That's all their responsibility was. But for this Ummah, and for this Prophet والسلام, the Prophet understood he was Khatm al nabiyin he was the last messenger. But he also knew that there would be generations after him, exceeding generations after him. He knew that the Day of Judgment was near, but that he was only the first sign of it. And there was many more to come. So he knew that this message that he spent 23 years sacrificing every day, putting his life on the line time and time again, standing sleepless nights because of this message and the weight of relieving it. He knew that this would have to continue after him. But who's going to do the job? No more messengers are coming. He took that torch and he handed it to this ummah. Making this ummah, Kuntum khayran ummatin ukhri nas. Making this Ummah the greatest nation that ever came forward from mankind. Why? Because you, you command to that which is good and you forbid that which is evil. You do the work of the Anbiya before you. You do the work. That's why. We don't get that title just because we hope for it. Just because we wish and we demand it. We've lit, we un, unfortunately, we live in a world where everyone feels entitled nowadays. That just because you say you deserve a right, that you deserve it. Where do we ever get that idea as Muslims? That just because I say I'm a Muslim, I deserve the rights that Allah gave to every Muslim before me. Even the companions. Allahu musta'an. They did the work to get that title. Kuntum khayran ummatin ukhrij. They did the work for that. What are we working for now? Big house, fat bank account, fancy car, cush leather interior. That's what we want now. That's what we work for. They work for something else. And they work for this dunya. The companions were all poor. No one ever said that Muslims got to be poor. You can't do anything for if you're poor. How can you help the rest of the world if we don't have no money? <laughs> How are we going to help those who are in need and we're the ones in need? No, we're not commanded to be poor. There's no, word, no command like that. Abu Bakr wasn't a poor man. He became poor many times over and rich many times over, but he wasn't a poor man. Abdurrahman ibn Auf became poor and rich many times over. Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu an, very wealthy man. He was known to wear a qamis and then give it away and put on a new one the next day. He had it like that. But one thing they did have in is they understood where each belonged. They understood where this dunya belonged and they put it in its place when it needed to be put in its place. And they understood where deen belonged and they always kept it in its place on top. That was just a reality. But us, we say we're Muslim, we should rule the world. That, that, that's what we're running around screaming. That just because we're Muslims, we're supposed to rule the world. <laughs> Brothers, we have trouble running businesses, running masjids, running Islamic societies, organizations, conferences, without people ready to go to blows. Brothers falling out for years over how this was supposed to be arranged and how it was supposed to be arranged. I've seen it time and time and time again. I've been doing this for over a decade. The Muslim 17 years this year, alhamdulillah. 
So I'm telling you, I've seen it all, been all over this planet, seen as how we act. If you gave us the keys to the world right now, I don't know if the world would be livable in three months. I don't know. We'd start off killing each other, fighting on each other, who's supposed to run this, who's supposed to run that, next thing you know, we destroy everything along the path. What we need to be worried about is if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ready, wants us to be leaders right now. Does Allah want us to be leaders right now? Because what Allah wills cannot be denied. What Allah establishes as His will is undeniable by anybody or anything. So if Allah wanted us to be in leadership, we'd be in leadership right now. But right now we're in a position of dhullah, of humiliation across the world. Look at us. We're, 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 we're scattering across the world right now. Muslims are walking across eight, nine countries <laughs> looking for a safe place to put their head at night and we want to run the world. Allahu musta'an. You just need to leave it to the people who are doing right now and we need to fix up. That's what we need to be worried about. Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pleased with us? From the looks of things right now, I don't think so. My humble opinion, I don't think so. Allah may be pleased with many of us, but He's not pleased with the conglomerate of us to be able to put us in that position again. The companions, Allah confirmed it upon them. I was pleased with them, and they were pleased with me. That's why He gave them that position of leadership across the world. So the Prophet handed them that torch. And then what did He say? Oh Allah, bear witness. Oh Allah, bear witness. Three times he said it. Oh Allah, bear witness. I have conveyed your message. Think about what the Prophet just said. وسلم. He said, Oh Allah, you gave me a message 23 years ago. Now I'm telling you, I've done it. I've done it and I have entrusted it to the best generation you've ever brought forward for mankind. So he's basically saying, I'm tapped out. I've done what I believe I can do. And how did Allah respond? Let's look at the response of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this accord. He revealed, Aliyam, Akmaltu lakum dinukum. This day, He revealed right after the Prophet made this statement. This day I have perfected for you your religion. I have made it command. And that which is perfect needs no additions or subtractions. And I have established and conferred my na'ma upon you. And I have chosen for you Islam as your only way of life. That was revealed on the backs of this Ummah. Allah began His way of life for humanity with the first of His creation, Adam a.s. He sent His first messenger with the people of Nuh a.s. He continued to advance that religion for the needs of humanity and the rules and regulations throughout time with the same core tenet of worship me alone and obey me alone and obey the people I send to you. But on the backs of this Ummah, Allah decided to complete His way of life for mankind. That is an honor that no other Ummah can ever claim to have. That is why this Ummah has been given such favor. We are an Ummah that even though we are the last Ummah on the Day of Judgment, we will be first. We will be first. Allah gave us that honor. This Ummah will be first. We are an Ummah that when every other messenger comes before us, when Nuh alayhi salam comes before Allah, Allah will ask Nuh, did you convey your message? And Nuh will say, but Allah, you know I conveyed my message, my Lord. Allah will ask the people of Nuh, did any messenger come to you? What will they say? No, no messenger came to us. <laughs> they look around, anybody, did he come to you? No, he didn't come to me. Try to get out of it. No, no messenger came to me, man. <coughs> Allah will ask Nuh, do you have a witness? You have a witness to say you did your job. Whom will he say that he is his witness? Go to Muhammad and his followers. They will witness for me. They will witness for me. Allah will accept the witness of this Ummah and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu When Adam alayhi salam is tracked down on the day of Qiyamah, when he's tracked down, and they will say to him, Adam, Allah created you first. Allah is angry. Look at him. Look at, look at what's going on here, man. The sky is cracking. The seas are boiling. Stars are falling out of their places. Adam, go talk to Allah and calm him down. What will Adam salam, say? It's recorded in Bukhari. Adam will say Allah is angry like he's never been before on this day and he will never be this angry again. Nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. I disobeyed my Rabb in the garden. Nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. I can't help you. Go to Nuh We will run to Nuh. Same thing. 
will say to Nuh, please talk to Allah. Allah Nuh will say, nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. I was given one dua by Allah. Every prophet is given one dua by Allah that they can ask for anything they wish. And Allah will grant it to them. They won't won get out of jail free or whatever they want. One dua. Nuh will say, Allah gave me one dua and I used it on my people. That's what destroyed the people of Nuh was his dua against them. So he'll say, nafsi, nafsi. Okay, go to Musa. Go to Ibrahim. Ibrahim will say, I lied about my sister. Nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. Musa will say, I killed the man by accident. Nafsi, nafsi, nafsi. Isa will say, do you not see that they worship me like I was Allah? Nafsi, nafsi. I, I cannot help you. Go to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We will go to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He will not deny. He will not turn us away. Because see, he's kept a secret weapon. The day of Qiyamah. You know that dua that every prophet had? They used it. They used it in their lifetime for something. Isa saved himself from the cross with it. No, destroyed his own people. The other prophets used it for who knows what. I'm not sure of all of that. But the Prophet والسلام, said, My dua, the one that Allah gave me, even though he went through so much, you have to understand what our Prophet والسلام, suffered through. How much, how much he must have been tempted at many times. He could have used that dua. He said, no, I saved it to the day of Qiyamah for who? For you. I saved it for you. And on that day he will go before Allah and prostrate and worship Allah as long as Allah wishes. And then Allah will tell him, Qum, get up and ask me anything and I will not reject you. And he will only have one thing to say. Ummati, ummati. My ummah, my nation, forgive them. And Allah will forgive the minor sins of this ummah because of that dua. That's who we are. You understand? That's who the Prophet والسلام, is. That's who Muhammad وسلم, is. So caring about his followers and mankind in general. That's the ummah that we are. And we walk around like we have something to hide. We have something to hide. We have nothing to hide. One last story and we'll wrap it up. And this story is the worst day in human history so far. So far. The very worst day in human history will be the day we stand in front of Allah. Worst day. Yawm al Adim, the great day. But the worst day in human history so far happened a few months after this last story that we talked about. <clears throat> and if you don't believe it's the most horrible story in human history and the saddest day of mankind, then your Iman needs a, needs a, it needs a wake up call, it needs a double check. You need to have a health check on your Iman. Take it to the, take it to the doctor and get a, get a full physical on it. Something's wrong. The Prophet was sick. He was sick. And he kept trying to get up and get better. He couldn't. Aisha radiallahu anha said he would get up, he would fall down, he would get up, he would fall down, he would get up, he would fall down. In his sickness, he commanded the best of this ummah, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu wa to lead the salah, signifying who should come after him and lead this ummah. We're, we're finishing in 10 minutes, 9 o'clock. Nobody gonna have a heart attack, right? We delay this a few minutes. Okay. Some places you go, woo! <laughs> Get ready to chop me down. Abu Bakr. I could go on about Abu Bakr and I could, I could diverge on a side note for the rest of the night about that man. Let me tell you something really quick about Abu Bakr. <laughs> Jannah has how many gates? How many gates does paradise have? Eight gates. Eight gates. Every one of you, if you go to Jannah, inshallah, you go through one of those gates. One of those gates is signified for you. Some of them are especially for those who kept fast and other reasons. After all of the Anbiya have entered into Jannah, and we're all waiting, those of us who go, inshallah, may Allah make us all amongst them. Amen. But as this Ummah is sitting outside the gates of Jannah, and the, the, the Anbiya have gone through, all eight gates of Jannah will open. All of them. Every single one of them will open. And every single angel, angel that guards that gates will call for one man. And they will say, Abu Bakr, as sadiq come through my gate. Give me the honor of walking through my gate. And the first human being after the prophets and messengers to enter through those gates of Jannah will be Abu Bakr as out of the mouth of the Prophet. So say what you want about Abu Bakr. But he then beat us all. He's already beaten us all. That's, that's certified. Certified. And for anyone who tries to insult their companions, they've lost their own minds. Because they're insulting the very linkage to their own religion. The very linkage to their own deen they're insulting. Because if Abu Bakr had not done his job, 
Allah Alam, where would we be today? If any of us would know the deen. But he signified Abu Bakr to lead the salah. There was some argumentation. It eventually happened. The Prophet was happy. Then he was laying his head on the chest of Aisha radiallahu anhu radaha, the woman whom he loved the most in this life. <clears throat> and something happened that Aisha wasn't privy to at the moment. <clears throat> you see, the angel of death, when he comes to you or I, <clears throat> it's a one-sided conversation. When the angel of death comes to us, there's no going to be... You're not gonna you're not gonna debate with him. He's gonna say soul, either beautiful soul or khabith soul, come out, come out. It'll either come out easy or it'll get ripped out. But one way it's coming out. But with the NBA of Allah, it's a different story. The angel of death has to ask permission. It's to ask permission and he gives them a choice between death and life. You know the story of Musa and the angel of death. Yeah? You know the story of Musa and the angel of death. Anybody remember that story? Know that story. Musa, <laughs> Musa caught the angel of death. He was uh, scared him. So Musa hit him. Knocked one of his eyes out. Anyway, that's Musa. Musa was a little bit different. But um, the angel of death came in to the room of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam. I shouldn't see him. He came in. And the first thing he did is what every prophet had been given before him. He showed him his place in Jannah. Showed him his place. So Aisha said she saw the Prophet looking at the ceiling, smiling, smiling. Can you imagine that place? I mean, we can't even fathom paradise, period. But to fathom the pinnacle of it, the highest place, the very, very top, the very, 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 very top, above which is only the Arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to see that. And then he's asked, would you like to recover from this illness? Allah has given you the choice. Would you like to recover from this illness? and be with your companions. Or you want to go there? Or you want to go there? The Prophet والسلام, made an easy choice. Aisha radiallahu anha said she saw him ask for a, a siwak. She wanted he, one of the companions came in. He saw a siwak in his pocket. He asked for it. She softened it with her own saliva and brushed his teeth. The last thing our Prophet would ever taste in his life was the saliva of his wife Aisha radiallahu anha on this siwak. Then he looked up into the ceiling and he said, I want to be with the companion who's on most high. I want to be with the companion who's on most high. I want to be with the companion who's on most high. Then the angel of death took the most blessed soul that Allah had ever created and took it to the highest ranks of Jannah that exist. And that became the saddest day for human history. Human history, right here. It's the saddest day. And when Aisha realized it, she started to cry and she started to tell other companions what had happened. There was a man named Umar ibn al-Khattab who, who never lost his cool, who was a man's man. If you wanted to learn how to be a man, young men, you're not going to get at these fashion magazines and on, on the TVs. Go look at the life of a man named Umar ibn al-Khattab and you learn how to be a man. You learn how to be a man. A man who didn't lose his cool over anything, lost it on that day. The same man 23 years before had a sword in his hand, ready to kill Muhammad sallallahu Now he has a sword in his hand again. But it's because he cannot accept this fact. He cannot accept the fact that this man is dead. He's saying that no, he went to be with Allah just like Musa went to be with Allah and I'm not gonna... Anybody who says he's dead, I'll kill you myself. Abu Bakr, who had gotten word he was out, away from the city on the outskirts, he rushed directly in to the room of the Prophet Aisha said he uncovered his head smiled, kissed his forehead, and said, you're just as beautiful and deaf as you are. And then covered it back up, and he came out, stood on the minbar of the Prophet والسلام, and said the very famous words, that if you worship Muhammad, Muhammad is dead. He's dead. But if you worship Allah, then I know that Allah is al hay He's alive and he never dies. And he recites the verse, if he dies or he is killed, then will you turn back on your heels? Omar at that moment said he realized what had really happened and he just fell down. He fell down and he started to weep. All the companions were lost on that day. They described themselves as sheep who had been left by their shepherd on a cold winter's night. They didn't know what, didn't know what to do next. To the leadership of Abu Bakr, he stood up and took over leadership when he was given the bear. But it was the saddest day of human history. But there was a woman on that day who understood the full context of what had happened. And this is how we end. 
She understood the full context of what had happened. Her name was Umm Ayman. Anybody know who that is? Who was Umm Ayman? You gotta go way back in the seerah for that one. She looked after him after the death of his mother. She became the mother after his mother. She lived to see him grow up. She lived to watch him become a prophet. She lived to watch him suffer. She suffered with him. She lived to make hijrah. She lived to see the battles. She lived to see the victories. She lived to see it all. And then she lived to watch him die. This woman saw it all from beginning to end. He treated her because many people have asked, how do we know how to treat our mother in the example of the Prophet ﷺ if he had no mother? I tell you, go look at the way he treated Umm Ayman when she walked in the room. <coughs> go read any hadith of how he treated Umm Ayman when she walked into the room. Show you how you're supposed to treat your mother. He would jump. He would jump up, immediately run, kiss her hands and feet and, and give her his seat, make her sit down, make her comfortable. He treated Umm Ayman like his mother and he used to call her my mother after my mother. Anyway, she started to cry on that day in Abu Bakr and Umar because she came and saw the Prophet وسلم, her son. And she started to cry and Abu Bakr and Umar tried to console her and said, look, He's better in life, or he's better in death than in life. He suffered so much for us. She said something profound and prolific. She said, I'm not crying because of his death. Everybody dies. Every soul is going to taste death. She said, but I am crying because the wahi from Allah has stopped. Just let that sink in for a minute. She said, I'm crying because Allah won't speak to us anymore. <coughs> You want to see a woman who loved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? A woman like that. Even her own son's death, the first thing she thinks about is that Allah is going to stop speaking to us now. That's the real sadness of this day. Is that wahi, the connection between Allah and mankind, is gone. Gone. Allah will not speak to us anymore. No more wahi comes down. Allah is not going to speak to you from the clouds. He's not going to send angels to talk to you anymore. That's it. The next time you will speak to Allah directly or you will hear from Him directly will be on the day when you are being judged by Him. By then it's too late. So she understood that. And the companions began to cry. But they understood something about that that we don't grasp even sitting here right now. They understood that yes, maybe Allah has stopped speaking. But that's only because He said everything He needed to say. This is the only reason Allah would stop speaking to us is if He said everything He needed to say. And we have it with us. Kalamullah. Lining these shelves. Kalamullah is with us. It's with us. For those of us who were born into Islam, Alhamdulillah, you've known it since you were a child. For those of us like myself who came into Islam, then we've learned it along the way, but we all have it with us. But what about those people out there? Yeah, what about the people out there right now walking in front of this masjid? How are they going to know Qalamullah? How do they know what Allah has said to them? You think they're going to find it on the TV? In the newspaper? You think they're going to read it in the metro? On BBC? On Sky? Fox News? Any of that? No. They're never going to hear what Allah has told them. So who's going to tell them? That's your job. That's mine and your job. The companions understood that. So they went out and spread this deen. This is why they're buried all over the world. Because they went out and did their job. Spreading the da'wah. This is why the world became an Islamic empire. The civilized world became an Islamic empire for a very long time. We forget our history and who we are. But there became a time in our history where we decided that we had better things to do. We had gotten enough, we had done enough, and we became lazy and Allah took it all from us. Now it's up to us, this ummah, I think this next generation has got it a little bit down better than we do, to take that torch out there to the rest of the world. We have a job to do. And lastly, I want you to think about something as I close. Go home tonight. If you forget everything else I've said tonight, I won't be bothered. But if you will remember this, you'll have done yourself a great service. <coughs> What was the first thing that Allah created? Al-Qalam, the pen. Al-Qalam was the first thing that Allah created. What did He tell that pen to do? Look to write. And the pen said, write what? He said, write everything. Everything that will ever happen, ever, any place, any time, anywhere. The Prophet والسلام, said when he met his Isra al Miraj, that that pen has been lifted from the paper and the ink has become dry. I want you to remember something. How many of you are born a Muslim? Raise your hand, you're born a Muslim, raised a Muslim. You know Allah from young age. Anybody else in here a revert like me, you came to Islam later on in life? A few of you? Either way, it doesn't matter. In that book, when Allah was writing your name and having your name being written down by that pen, Allah wrote next to your name, Muslim. 
What had you done for that? What had you done for that? 50,000 years before anything. Allah wrote down, write down his name, her name, next to it, Muslim. Allah wrote down, I had my name written down, and then said right next to his name in 1998, in December, I'm going to guide him to Islam. What have I done for that? Nothing. This is why I feel like I have a job to do. Because I was given that before I existed. You were given that before you existed. It wasn't because you were born somewhere, because you were raised in some family. It's because Allah gave it to you as a ni'mah, as a gift that you cannot repay Him for. The little bit He asked for you to do is to worship Him and get out there and help some other people know what you know. That's all I want for you today, inshaAllah ta'ala. Worship Allah, get out there, help some people to know what you know. It's that simple. What you know, share with others who don't know, inshaAllah ta'ala.